Folks, welcome to episode one of the I Tried to Be Straight podcast with Nate and Susie. This is Susie. Hi guys, I'm Susie. I'm Nate, and um, this is episode one. We are building this podcast to try and give more stories like ours. We are both Christian, grew up in the church, and had a really hard time getting to where we are now. Just sorting through everything that comes with being Christian and being gay, and trying to figure out our place in this world. And so this first episode is going to be my story, and um, I think the next episode will be Susie's story. Yep. So we're going to let you get to know us, and then we'll be interviewing other people as well. But I'm going to be telling my story, but you probably don't know Susie. Some of you might be here from my TikTok, which that has been a ride. Thank you for watching. And um, yeah, it's a crazy journey. I came out on there, and now a lot of people started watching, and it's been really cool talking to people and sharing that. But just quickly... Susie is here. She's a good friend of mine. Very similar story, and you'll hear more of that in the next episode. But I just want to introduce you to her and say thank you for being here, Susie. Nate, thank you for posting on your TikTok because that's how we connected locally. True. And so we got coffee, and I think I fell in love with Nate, you know, the moment I laid eyes on him. And I was like, wow, this is the most I'm beautiful I'm gay for man the record. I'm not bi. So I have sorry. ever seen. It's okay. I mean, I was disappointed, but. <laughs> 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 Nate is amazing. We talked, and I by the end up. of it, we just became friends, and then we hung out and um, bonded through some mutual uh, hurts, pains, and so trauma I'm, bonding. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, I, I trauma bond with people. It's my best way of making friends, and that's okay. Yeah, Sometimes, he's good at it. <laughs> if you're me, and you have enough trauma, that's your best way of bonding, and that's fine. That's true, and that's okay. <laughs> Actually, I think it was more, you watched me spill all my guts, and so you trauma bonded with me then, yeah. and then I trauma bonded with you when you spilled your guts. My guts, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of guts spilled that day. <laughs> we both spilled guts, and it was messy. <laughs> we have that in common. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here. Yeah. I'm so glad to start this with you. I think um, people are going to enjoy hearing your story, and this will be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, and if nobody watches this, we're going to have a good time either way. Yeah, we are. Um, no pressure to watch it. If you don't want to watch it, that's fine. That's fine. It's literally fine. But if you want to um, listen, if you want to send to a friend, yeah, yeah, yeah. Share it. We'll talk about sharing it. later. Share okay. It. So I'm a little nervous to do this because I've never shared my whole story and I think this is going to be fun, but I did watch Boy Erased this morning. Have you seen that? No, I so haven't. So Boy Erased, if you want to just skip my whole story, just watch the movie Boy Erased because it's basically my life story. Um, it's about this preacher's kid who like essentially goes to conversion therapy and goes through all this stuff. And I'm like watching this movie and I'm just crying the whole time. And I'm like, this is basically my story. But Lucas Hedges plays the guy and okay. I'm like if we want to make a sequel to that movie about me we can and please can it Chalamet be, you. be <gasps> me I think he'd be great oh my gosh he's so, so cute too or Kit Connor from Heartstopper <laughs> he'd have to lose weight because I'm not that I'm not that buff wait is this movie on Netflix it's on Netflix right now Watch I think it. I have seen it watch Boy Race you can skip this whole podcast his story is better than mine and there's acting and I cannot I could never Nicole Kidman maybe too, I right? could and Russell Crowe Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, look at Troy that. Troy Sivan. All right, so the ready? people want to know, Nate. Are you ready for the full Nate Peters story? How straight did you try to be? I I tried so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up all my gay things. Let's dive I into pretended it. I didn't like baking, all these things. Um, but yeah, are you ready? Let's go. Story time? Yeah. Okay, full Nate Peters story. Um, I will do the best I can to make this short. Um, I'm not trying to give you every detail of my life, just the pertinent ones, but I will do my best to keep it concise. Childhood. Let's start there. <laughs> Where so it all starts. I was a very lovable child. I was very cute. I um, was just kind of the person that was always like very huggable. I was chubby as well. I was a really chubby baby. And so I was just like really like, I was kind of like a lover. I just really like love to hug people and just love to be around people. Um, but as I was growing up and probably like five, six, I realized that I was a little bit different than my brothers. My brothers would love sports and I'd try and play with them, but I'd always be worse. And I found myself more often hanging out with my sisters because they would watch romances or they would watch musicals. And I'd be like six or seven, I'd be like, I'd much rather bake cookies with my sister than go play football with my brother. And so masculinity was so prominent in our house that I always felt like a little bit it was obvious that I was a little different than the rest of my family, than the rest than the boys. And they invited me in, they wanted me to play with them. I was bad, but I would try. Mm -hmm. But it was never my first choice. And we'd always watch sports like every weekend and football for six hours. Like, I know people like that. It's a lot of football. But that is my, <laughs> I'm still traumatized by that. Like if our, for Thanksgiving, we all watched a football game and I'm just like watching football, I'm like, 
at the start at 5 p.m. We're watching football instead of hanging out. And I'm like, this is not, Yeah. I'm not even playing this game. Mm -hmm. Who cares? But I, I've gone into a little bit and I've tried to watch sports, but I just wasn't geared for it. Like I wasn't that kind of guy. So we are also a pretty intense, strict household. So as a pastor's kid, my parents were pastors of a small church at this point, mm. and they were pretty intense religiously. Like they were just very much trying to go by the books. They had listened to the Gothers, which is like this yeah. uh, pretty strict organization. They're just trying to do everything perfect. Um, and my mom came from a World War II household. Like, so she, you know, they were a pretty intense family as well. And mm. so she just wanted to do everything the best she could. And so she, you know, was a little bit afraid to not do the right thing. So they instilled in us really early, we need to be good Christians, we need to do this, we need to do that. Jesus, like we need to be saved. So at four years old, I got saved. I confessed mm -hmm. my life to God. And I still remember that. And the thing was though, a couple months later, I went into my mom's room, I remember doing this, kind of like crying, because I was like, I don't know, how do you know for sure like I'm saved all the way? Because we had talked so much about hell already at that point. Wow. Hell was just like a current like thing, like a common thing we talked about. I was terrified of hell. And I'm like, well, all I did was say those words. How can you verify that I'm 100% saved? I told my mom, I'm like, are you sure I'm saved? Are you 100% sure? I can't, like, I can't go to hell. Like, This I'm a, was at four. You were I was like five. I was like five oh years gosh, old at this point. Okay. And she's like, no, well, you did this and this. And she's like, I'm like, yeah. And she's like, yeah, no, you're okay. You're not going to go to hell. I'm like, okay. This is five years old. That's crazy. I am terrified of this place with these demons. And like, you go to Sunday school, you see graphic representations of this stuff. Absolutely. So in my brain, I was already like, I gotta make sure I don't go to hell. Five years old, this was in my head. And no one even thought I was gay at this point. I was just starting to realize I wasn't fitting in. So about this time, like I, I had some guy friends that were in our like community and I always really wanted close guy friends never really could make them even like so f around like probably like one to seven i was we were in this small town and i always noticed like guys didn't really want to hang out with me mm. like other boys yeah i was kind of isolated girls would want to be around me mm. but boys just like i just really wanted a best friend more than anything mm. and no one ever wanted to get that close to me and I just had this deep desire to have a close connection. Now, me and my brother were close. Yeah. We found things to do like video games. I liked doing that with him and I'd play sports with him, but finding a close guy friend, I could never do. So I started to realize that as well. Like, is there something wrong with me? Why doesn't anyone want to be my best friend? Mm -hmm. I saw these other people with best friends. None of the guys, they always chose each other. Interesting. I would always find a group of three people. I'd be part of that group and the other two guys would become best friends and I was always left out. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I knew that like I was different. I liked different things and I wasn't as good at sports, but the rejection was obvious enough that I could feel it. I could feel like I was getting rejected and I was a very smart kid. I was very bright. Yeah. And so I could feel this just the rejection. You feel rejection. Yeah. I could tell that it's they, hard. yeah, they, they didn't prefer me. Yeah. I knew. So what was like the message communicated to you when you'd have a a group of friends and then they'd go off i knew i was the lesser interesting i was the i was the least likable i was there's something wrong with me hmm. so how did that warp your perspective on life at that age or yourself or god i learned that like i needed to fix myself somehow and that was my biggest goal getting acceptance was my biggest goal yeah i'm a people person i yeah. obviously like talking i like community and so realizing that no one really liked me. I'm like, I wanted to figure that out more than anything. Mm. So it definitely shaped my perception about the people around me and the things around me. I, I knew that there was something wrong with me. This undiagnosable, like we didn't really talk about being gay at that point. I wasn't even thinking like that. I'm just like, I am weird. I am defective. People don't enjoy me. What is this? And this was what, at what age? Like six, seven years old. Oh my gosh. I was very in tune with with this dynamic. Yeah. And, and that's a... That's a heavy perspective to to grow up in yeah. and be in school in. And when you just want to belong and have friends yeah. and to feel like you're the lesser, like you said, you're very othered yeah. already at a very young age. Absolutely. Othered. Like, I don't remember not being othered. Mm. Like, my whole existence has been the other, the, the one that's not as likable, the mm. one that's not as good. I am worse in some weird, intangible way. 
it's interesting because knowing you now people gravitate towards you and you're very magnetic and so to hear that you had that experience growing up as a kid is just I'm, I'm curious how yeah you got to now first 22 years of my life <laughs> I felt like I was just this unlikable mm. mess of a person I got rejected so many times I just figured I was permanently defective Damaged, I was yeah. a disaster I I hated myself on an insane level and yeah started at six I hated myself at six years old on some level it just grew more and more uh, around like age seven, this group of prophetic people came to my parents' church and came and prophesied that they were supposed to go into traveling prophetic ministry. We were one of those like, if you know Bethel, we're kind of like a Bethel-y kind of group of people. There was a like Bethel-y kind of group of people. It was prophetic. Yeah. It was that kind of that kind of vibe. And they prophesied to my parents that they should go out and start preaching and prophesying. Mm. And so they did. Um, we moved to Spokane for a couple of years to get ready. And then we sold our house, bought an RV a $10,000 travel trailer and made that a permanent home, our only home for, well, about six years. Whoa. So now already I was not like accepted by many people. All of a sudden we went from a semi-stable community to no community at yeah. all. And then we would go from church to church and my parents would speak and me and my brother would like either just sit in the back or run the book table and we'd be at churches from like 7 p.m. to 1 a.m over and over and over while we homeschooled now i mean it was kind of our parents were always different like god was everything so we're like we're giving up our, our lives for god in a way this is just what you do if you're a peters like that's my family we just do this so i wasn't like that aware that this was that weird i was like probably eight when we started traveling but i did know that everywhere we went not only was i weird now we were the pastor's kids that were just visiting we were the guests and we would hang out with other pastor's kids. And if you know about pastor's kids, we're, we're a-holes. You guys are a we different suck. breed. <laughs> <laughs> no, so all these pastor's kids would just reject me instantly. Oh no. All these church people, like, so my brother was like two years older than me. He's cool, masculine, like competitive, sportsy. He would get some friends. I was just like, I'm garbage. None of these kids would wanna hang out with me. So I would just try my best to make friends get rejected, be like, I'm done. I, I read books. My, like probably age eight to age 14 was me reading books and playing video games. Oh my god! And then we made a few friends that my brother made and I would just mooch off his friends. And I'd be like, well, they'll accept me because my they like my brother. Yeah. I was aware though, all my friends were from my brother and I was fully aware that I'm incapable of making friends, but at least I can have like a little you were taste. Smart. You were smart with it. I'm a smart, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a little taste of community and I just keep using my brother to mm -hmm get me something at all. I was I was okay with scraps. Yeah. My life, and my therapist knows this, <laughs> my life has been, I will take the scraps of connection because no one wants all of me. Mm -hmm. I am defective and I'm okay with a lesser level of connection because I'm not worthy of a full one because there is something wrong with me. And I didn't even know what it was at this point. I remember this one story. I went to camp and we knew some people we go there and I'm like in this room with all these these teens and they're older and they're saying a bunch of guy stuff and they're like kind of crude and I they didn't really talk to me and I was so nervous I remember just like digging deep in my sleeping bag hiding and just crying myself to sleep and it's still a very vivid memory they I ended up talking to counselors and they ended up moving me to another room but I just had no idea how to I just knew boys wouldn't like me yeah so a camp like a same like you know boys and the girls are separated like i knew girls would want to be friends with me sometimes but all guys yeah. in one camp i just was so so afraid of guy connection at this point because they had all just treated me that horribly yeah. christian guys don't treat effeminate men well mm. i mean you might not see me as that effeminate right now but back then i had a i was worse at hiding it like ironically now i'm out and i'm like i'm okay to seem effeminate yeah but i've just been closeted for so long i'm like i i don't know what i am i i might get like more silly as time goes on but right now i'm i'm relatively straight passing back then they knew so i was just done but i wanted guy friends more than anything couldn't get any and so this was just like the story of my life growing up but go to church after church get rejected over and over again just pretty miserable and 
I knew that there was something different about me and I knew I wasn't liking girls, but I hadn't really dealt with it. But then finally we get a house. I'm like probably 13. We get a house, we start living a semi-normal life, travel off here and there in Illinois. Um, I start to realize I'm looking at things that like might not be great, passing like the underwear section and I'm starting to like notice things. Yeah, your palms get a little sweaty. You're yeah, like, oh like, no. Because <laughs> at this point growing up, I knew there was something weird about me. I knew I'd been, kids started to call me names. I got called girly boy a lot no. on the field because I'd be bad at sports and I was different. So w- we would hang out at my sister's house. She had a neighborhood. I, uh, we'd hang out with the neighborhood kids and I would get teased. I was bad at sports and my voice was high pitched. So yeah, I got called girly boy. I knew I was starting to pick up the pieces that like maybe I might have, I might be gay. I was starting to hear about it. My mom had told me stories about her uncle who had died of AIDS. Wow. And she would tell me this story a lot and I'm not sure if she was like cute in. I think everybody knew yeah, that was different. I kept hearing the story from that. her. And so I was just like starting to realize what being gay was. When I was, I forgot to say this, when I was like probably eight, we couldn't go to Disneyland because the like gay agenda was happening there. Like Disney had done some really pro gay thing. And okay. so we canceled our Disneyland trip. And then we went to Knott's Berry Farm instead. And the couple years before that. It's a big downgrade. <laughs> I know. It's not the same. Snoopy ain't got no. it. Snoopy ain't got what Mickey does. Um, and the, the two years before that, I got the stomach flu at Disneyland. So I'd never experienced Disneyland. And I'm eight years old. I'm like, we're finally doing this. And then we cancel it, go to Knott's Berry Farm. So I had, I had gotten like little things that like, okay, gay is bad. And also I was starting to get little th- ideas of like, I might be that thing. I'm like, but probably not. I'm probably fine. You know, like maybe these people just think I'm weird. But then 13 years old, start looking at those things and I start getting like little flashes. I'm like, this better not be what I think this might be. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, this sounds like that thing that my parents have told me about for years that's uh, ruining America. (laughs) This thing, and it got, it ruined me somehow. It's infecting me and I'm like, (laughs) no, anything but this. Mickey Mouse got to me. (laughs) Anything but this. And I knew, I was like, okay. You know, like growing up, I'm like, oh, I'm just weird. I'm just quirky. I'm, you know, I'm just a funny, quirky little guy. You know, yeah. I'm just, I'm just Nate. Um, and then I was like, then I'm like, and I'm not gay. Then I start liking things that are a little, a little gay. A little on the fruity side, eh? And I was like, crap. Yeah, I was okay. just like, damn it. We can say damn it. I'm gonna say damn it. It's what fine. was your thought Lord. process when you were like, I think I might be gay. I think I might be the thing that everybody in my family hates and that my uncle died from and we can't go to Disney because of this. Like what, how did that land for you? So there's just so much fear involved already. I'm just terrified. Yeah. I was so afraid that I was just like, I'm not gonna, I think I instantly went to a denial of maybe this isn't what it actually is. Maybe I'm something else. Like I didn't actually look at what, I didn't look at the facts fairly. I was like, well, you know, maybe I just like this thing, or maybe I just like think I would look really good in those underwear. Like maybe, like I would do anything in my brain to rationalize that I wasn't that. Yeah. So I think denial was the first thing, but around probably like right before I turned 14, my mom was really perceptive and she knew I was acting weird. She confronted me and she's like, I feel like you've been looking at stuff on your computer. And I'm like, maybe. And she's like, what kind of stuff? And she grilled me until I told her all of the fun stuff I've been looking at on oh, the internet. Oh man. And then we go downstairs and she brings my brother and my dad into the room who didn't know anything about any of this. I didn't tell my brother. And she tells them everything. How old is your brother? He's 15 at this point. I was 13. Okay. And he's shocked because he's my closest friend. Yeah. Um, Really my only good friend is my brother. I hadn't told him. And my dad's there. And I'm just basically sobbing. Mm -hmm. And my mom's trying to help me. She thinks this is the best way, but she just was ill-equipped to handle this and i am just laid bare and so so ashamed Mm. i just felt like yeah i the way they're looking at me i could see the way they're looking at me every one of them was like terrified and i can feel fear we had a lot of fear in our household just 
I could feel their fear. So here I am feeling so afraid of being different and knowing for so long that I am so different. And now here all, here all my family are gathered around me, looking at me like I have cancer and I'm so ashamed. It's not just a disease that I was inflicted with. It was somehow something that I did wrong, that I, that makes me wrong. I'm not just, I'm not just a victim. I'm both the victim and the villain. Mm. I, in the Christian belief system, I potentially did something to make this happen. I'm not just someone that has a disease. I have a disease that I probably am responsible for and maybe I deserve and maybe is just me being defective again. So I am feeling all of this and I am feeling more shame than I have ever felt in my life. I could feel that feeling right now of just the self-hatred, the shame. Yeah. Like I was garbage. I was I was shameful. I was a failure in every way. I was I was gross. Mm. At 13 years old, I knew I was gross. There's no doubt in my head. That's interesting that growing up, you all you wanted was a friend. And you said something earlier that you know, this is what Peters do. And at that kitchen table with your brother, your dad and your mom, you weren't Peters because of who you are mm, and that's interesting it's 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 just yeah uh, again being othered yeah um, yeah this everything we were about was ministry right, the lord yeah. you know doing things and i this i couldn't be this and be that mm. it was yeah i wasn't i couldn't do what the peters do we we're all basically in ministry at this point too yeah and now i was doing something that basically like our destiny was involved in ministry. It was always that. So yeah, I was othered from the family. I couldn't do this. I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear and curious what you think. If you could l name yourself something at that point, because it sounds like one of the labels that you had on yourself was girly boy. If you could go back and kind of label that Nate, like what would it be? Like, if if it wasn't a Peter's boy, like what would it be? A gross boy. Uh, mm. uh, I mean, gay. <laughs> the worst word in our vocabulary. Mm. A gay boy. One kid called me Gaithan as a joke, knowing it would cut, and you obviously did. Like I, did, I, yeah. I was unlovable unlovable boy I would. um but going from that uh, my parents sent me to deliverance so therapy wasn't really something we did um because we're christians yeah and therapists are in cahoots with the colleges and all these psychiatrists to you know undermine the christian religion uh, according to my parents so we went to some fun spiritual deliverance um and i had a lot of people pray for me so i then had to Talk to friends of the family, like adult friends of the family. Some of my friends' parents, because we were only really connected to ministry people, I had to now tell them what I was looking at online and get them to pray for me and try and cast the demons out. Oh my gosh. Several different couples I had these conversations with. And looking back, these were not like super... <laughs> Like these were counselor. These are like the people you would last want you being counseled by. Oh, and here they are getting all of my personal details. And I'm like, okay, so I am afflicted with demons <laughs> is where my brain goes. And maybe if all these people pray for me, I won't be. But then it obviously doesn't work. And I still like those things. And so essentially at this point, I'm just like, well, I don't know what to do now. I'm just going to not look into this stuff, try and ignore it, and just move on. And essentially, everybody said, once you get to know a girl, like this stuff will kind of fade away. That's basically what they said. You just need to get close enough to a girl. You'll stop liking all this stuff. Was your mindset at this point, I want to be straight? Or was it? Oh, yeah. Okay. There was never, I never would allow myself to do any of this for a second. I was committed. I was in it. I was still fully like 
God or nothing. Like I was like, this is obviously evil. I never thought it could be okay for a second. And I looked down on gay people. I would look at gay people and be like, yeah, they're gross. Like, and feel gross when I mm-hmm. think that, but it was internalized homophobia to a yeah. extreme level. Like I, I never would let myself enter into that at all. I try to suppress, I grew up and just those teenage years, I just acted like it wasn't happening. I would like look at stuff and then feel really ashamed and like try not to for as long as I could. I started working at Starbucks, which as you probably know, is like the token job for any young gay man. Yes, it is. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I started working there and I did great. I actually got like a little more social. It was good. Like I started to make some friends, um, had kind of a community that um, worked there for like, I was like 19, but around when I was 18, one of my coworkers was like, you're gay, right? And I'm like, no, who told you that? And she's like, oh, you know, just a couple of us just assumed you were. And I'm like, why did you assume I was? Oh my gosh, that's terrifying. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, this and this. And I'm like, what do you mean this and this? And she described my mannerisms and the way I talked. I'm like, none of my Christian friends would tell me that because being gay doesn't exist so i thought that i had like because all through my life i had been like cutting down my different mannerisms i'd been like once i turned 13 i was aware okay you might be gay and i'd experienced all this rejection for being gay i've been slowly picking apart things i did and trying to like be the straightest i could yeah so my my personhood and this is this is a different tangent but essentially my self was this filtered version where I was trying to be as straight as possible. So everything I did would go through a filter. Like, I can't just be me. I have to be this person, like the least gay version of me. So I thought I was doing that well. I was exhausted all the time, by the way, because that is really effing exhausting to constantly be putting your personality through a filter yeah. to try and be straight. You mm-hmm. don't even know how to be who you are because you're just trying to not be something else. And That's at that point, thing. you're not only exhausted from wearing the mask, but people see through the mask and you're like, oh my gosh, like, what do you see that I don't see? Like, Exactly. You yeah. think you've got it all figured out. Yeah. You think you've masked it. Yeah. And the worst thing ever is to be gay. And now all these people see you as gay. So you are, you're like, oh, you all think I'm this horrible, awful thing. Great. I you're like, am I making it. these frappuccinos like a little too fruity? Like what is going on here? I know. I'm like. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing my best here to like... <laughs> You're stopping the chocolate chips. <laughs> I know. You can just like a little of that when I'm like, thanks for, thanks for coming to Starbucks. <laughs> no, and that's... It's insane to think... I think with this whole thing, and this is another tangent, but essentially like I was trying... I know people around me that were gay. I like wasn't even hanging around girls that often. Like I should have just been normal and been able to just pretend to be straight. But that's why part of me is like, I'm a good test subject for, even though I was separated and didn't have a lot of female influences, I just had non-standard male behaviors. I was unique. Yeah. There's no way around it. So after like trying to deny it, I realized that I was still giving that. But I was like, what can I do? I cried to a friend for a while. I I cry a lot, apparently. Um, (laughs) But I just was pressing through. I'm just like, I kept ignoring it. And I just told them all I wasn't. I mm-hmm. told her very, uh, like, effectively, like, I'm not gay. Tell everybody that told you that that I'm not. And basically, they, I basically yelled at them. And it was this whole thing. Like, oh my I had other coworkers, like, are you okay? It was this. Yeah. So I just hid that I was dealing with that. Um, I never felt attraction to girls. I was feeling fondness for boys. But I just, this whole phase, I was just like, I'm not gay. And so anytime I'd feel something that felt like maybe it's attraction to guys, I'd just be like, that's not that. Yeah. And be like, wow, that girl was really pretty. Like, I was gaslighting myself this whole time. I was like, so afraid to be gay, so knew that gay was evil and that I might be it, that I would just convince myself that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So I would basically just tell myself I wasn't. And anything that seemed gay, I would just be like, no, that's not that. That's this. Just so I could feel safe. I was so torn up by fear that the only way I could feel safe was to convince myself I wasn't. Because yeah. if I was gay, that's the worst thing that could ever happen. Yeah. Well, at that point, you're almost soothing five-year-old Nate mm-hmm. that is so intrinsically scared of hell. Fear of hell, fear of like the rejection of being gay too. Yeah. Like the worst things in my life were rejection and, you know, losing my religion, hell. And this thing was directly against both of those. So all the things I wanted were against this. So I wasn't even going to like, like not liking girls was not a big deal to me because I'm just like, you know what? I just want to be accepted you know so i'm just gonna like not even think about any of this so i'd have crushes on guys 
and I just, you know, bury them, bury yeah. them so far. I wouldn't get close enough to guys where I could feel that physical spark. Like I would feel it a couple times and I'd sit close and I'd be like, I'm just back gonna away. back away. Yeah. So about this time, tw- I was turning like 19. My brother decided to go to Bethel Ministry School, and I was like, California, sick. I'll come along for that because he was like my closest friend. So we start to uh, make plans to go there. I'm like, I'll go to the ministry school too. Might as well. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. Um, parents always just wanted me to do ministry, and I was just not really sure. Um, so we go to, we go over there, and we do this whole big move, say goodbye to the family, and start going to ministry school. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, started to realize I could let my personality out a little bit more. No one was really commenting on how I was acting, so I started to just be a little freer. I started to realize I could be a little extroverted and people started to respond well. I made it on one of the worship teams. I played bass and started to like exercise my personality a little bit more. Still didn't like girls. Still kind of was like looking at guys. And then also I like didn't really want to tell anybody I was gay. Cause I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not gay. So I just kind of kept that hidden. I yeah. just basically didn't do anything. I kind of like had a few weird dates with girls I'd be like, oh, yeah, that girl's really cool. And they're like, yeah, why don't you go on a date? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I'd go on a date and I'd be like, yeah, no, it just wasn't my type. Yeah. You do that for a while. Christian culture, purity culture lets you delay this for so long. <laughs> so I was just like, n- my fears were so much bigger than my desire for romance. And I'm just like, I'm not going to mess with any of that. I don't want to poke the fear bear of like, am I gay? Mm. So if I don't date, I can put that question farther right. down the road. So was there for a while, did my thing. You know, met a lot of other closeted gay men. Really? Bethel really At attracts Bethel? a lot of closeted gay men. Yes. Wow. A lot of them are out now. Like like a third of my class. I don't want to say that for sure, but like it was a crazy number of How did you how did you guys have those conversations? Was it like Well, we didn't talk about it. It's just that obvious. Interesting. Okay. But they're out now. Yeah. They're out now and I saw them. Every time they come out after I'd be like when I wasn't closeted when I didn't want to come out and I saw these guys come out, I'm like this doesn't look good for me as they'd all drop like flies. Like they, you know, basically say, what was I doing at Bethel? Like I was obviously gay and wow. yeah. I, and I still know if there are still some that I would say are probably still closeted. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, you don't know. You, you don't yeah, know. You, do, you don't know. So Bethel was, it, it served its purpose. I did make some good friends there. One of my best friends is still like from there. And I've, I learned a lot there about, I didn't, don't feel like I learned a lot of useful, um, life skills but i did learn how to be myself more and i met a lot of people that were very loving and accepting not necessarily the leaders the leaders were hit or miss but i met some cool people so there wasn't a whole waste but so the youth group of bethel's jesus culture they are this pretty big worship movement they were going down to sacramento to start uh their own church right and at around the time i'd finished work or finished like ministry school and my sister was in the sacramento area so i moved down here to be a part of Jesus culture and hang out with my sister. Um, I was in some web jobs and I was kind of like working on all that, but then Jesus culture needed volunteers. I started running the young adults department, realized I was pretty good at that. And eventually they hired me. Now this boss, the guy that, uh, originally I was running young adults and then something happened with the leaders. They put another leader in charge and all of a sudden I was the assistant to the young adults leader. I'm like, okay, whatever. He really liked me and he eventually hired me as his assistant and I was doing merchandise for Jesus Culture as well as young adults. So that was a pretty, like there was a good season. I made some good friends, some that I still have now, but I think I wanted to work at Jesus Culture because it meant being in a safe environment where like there's people to help me stay straight. I knew that if I kept myself in an environment where I felt really afraid to come out that I would never have to worry about it. Because I was, in my head, fear was such a big ruler in my life. In my head, I was like, if I don't stay in structure, maybe that voice that like thinks it's okay to be gay will take over. And mm. it's basically protecting myself from my own freedom. Yeah, I was afraid of freedom because I was like a moment of weakness. I'll go for freedom and fall into sin. So working at Jesus Culture, pros and cons. I met good friends. Um, still like put the dating thing under. I remember saying at young adults one time, I'm like, uh, this one's like, who are you dating? I was like 25, 26. I was a pretty eligible bachelor at this point. I, I had gotten pretty good at faking straight and some girls were like interested. And I was like, oh, I'm just not looking for that at this time. 25 years old, never really <laughs> dated a girl longer than two weeks, like, like a few days. Actually, at this point, I had never really gone on more than one date with a girl. I was just like, no, I'm just 
purity, you know, Jesus, Jesus, Celibacy. Jesus it's all about God. <laughs> yeah. Um, but really I didn't, I knew that if I like actually started to date more that I'd have to confront the fact that I yeah. don't like girls. Oh. So I was just waiting for a magical girl that could take me through all this. So it's like, whatever. So I just like put that on pause still. I'm like 25, 26. And then eventually my boss became like a mentor to me and our relationship was a bit dysfunctional, but my boss, there was someone else that had come out in the church and I knew him. I was part of the same purity group. I was trying to be as in purity group, not because I had a like a purity problem, but just because I was attracted to men. Yeah. At this point, I was like becoming more and more aware of it. So I'm like, I'll join this purity group and they'll help me stay, whatever. Anyways, I think this guy had come out and decided he didn't like want to pretend to be straight anymore, but he had a wife and kids and it was oh, this man. whole thing in the church. That's hard. But we were in the same group together. I think people kind of heard about me somehow. I'm not sure. But all of a sudden... At my work, my boss started asking me a lot of questions after I was like crying in prayer because this guy's a friend of mine and I was like, him coming out really made me think, man, if this guy's been married for 10 years and never was attracted to his wife once, like oh, that's devastating. That he told me all the all of it, all the details. I'm like, you never felt feelings for your wife. And he's like, no. And I'm like, why'd you get married to her? And he's like, well, my church told me to get married to her and it would keep developing. And I'm like, all my perceptions of how this is supposed to work, like you're gonna fall in love with her, you can change, whatever. Because I had started to tell people that I didn't like feel attraction to girls at this point, right? Yeah. I'd gotten to enough time where I'm like becoming more aware. But I had all these perceptions like, okay, I just need to find the right girl. I need to like engage in physical contact and start like making these things happen. Even though I feel no spark, something will happen. Right. Yeah. He was starting to mess with those perceptions. So I'm talking to him and all this, and then somehow my boss has asked me all these questions and I'm like, how? Does he know? I'm not sure. But I'm like, Something's not adding up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, he asked me enough questions, and I was like crying after a prayer meeting. And I'm like, yeah. He's like a mentor. I'm like, sure, I'll tell him. I told him. I was like, yeah, I'm look like I'm attracted to this and this. And he's like, wow, thanks for telling me. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you know, this isn't like I've seen guys go through this. Like, I had this one friend who went through this, and now he's like, man, I love the you know what now. He's like, I used to like that, but now I love this woman. Blah 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 expletive he's like now i like i like women so much and I, he's like i know you can be like that too and i'm like okay mm -hmm. whatever um he's like you want to get therapy i'm like yeah i'd be done to get therapy maybe so i go out for lunch i come back and in that room with him in our office is the ceo and head pastor of this mega movement shut up massive huge movement million followers this is the the guy i don't know this guy like at all i've talked to him like four times he's like my boss 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 and my my mentor slash boss was like, hey, um, Nate's gone through, like going through some stuff. Nate, do you want to talk? Do you want to tell him? And I have no, I have no choice at this point. You got outed to this I guy? I had to out myself at that point. Oh my gosh, okay. So I went from no one knowing in that church, which I feel like maybe people were talking, I don't know, but here I am outing myself to one of the most famous Christian leaders in the world. <laughs> and And I did not even fully get mad about it at that point because I was like well they just want to help me this is for my best they're trying to cure me and they're going to get me free therapy so you know what this is for the best this feels bad but you know what this is probably good that was my headspace oh my god I did not fully even get mad about it at that point now obviously what <laughs> but yeah. back then I was just like okay they're trying to help me so I go to the therapist but he's not a licensed therapist. He's just a 60 year old pastor from another church who has counseled a lot of people. And we start talking and he does some general like helpful stuff, but he doesn't know how to fix this. And I'm starting to realize that, but I'm going through all the motions. We're in therapy. There's like six or seven months of therapy. We're not getting anywhere. And I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm forgiving this person, I'm forgiving that person. I'm like trying more things. I'm going on dates on his recommendation. I'm like, dates still, whatever. I'm not feeling any sparks. What do you think I should do? no really answer kind of looping around finally he's like hey have you ever like gone for like three months without thinking about this without like looking at anything and i'm like yeah and he's like well i think it'd be really good to just do a detox and just like not think about anything gay for like three months oh my gosh okay i'm like i've done this before and he's like yeah but i just feel like this is this is right I'm like okay so i go out there feeling pretty defeated because i'm like we've been doing this for a year at this point yeah. i don't feel like this guy knows anything and i go to a young adults night I see my best friend, like one of my best friends, and I give him a hug, and all of a sudden I just start sobbing because I felt the defeat 
of this person was supposed to be the person that can help me. I finally like found a like a counselor and he obviously doesn't have any advice except for things I've already tried. So that was devastating. That broke something in me of like, I don't know if change is actually something that, Possible, that works. Yeah. yeah. I went back to that therapist three months later and I think I'd gone a couple times during, but I went to him and then he's like, yeah, how's it going? And I told my story. I'm like, so it's the end of the three months. What do you think? And he's like, oh yeah, we were doing that, weren't we? No way. And I was like, yeah, we're doing it three months and then we were going to have a solution. He's like, oh yeah. And then he didn't really know what to do next after that. So wait, can we back up? What was yeah. this guy's, what was his experience in this realm? And like, what made him the expert? No idea. Okay, Nothing. Cool. No license, probably no degree. Probably just a guy. Okay. Just a guy with pastoral we experience. Love that. Yeah. Let's, let's send Nate to this. It's not the, he's not the worst person I've talked to after going to like super like fruity, not fruity, good, fruity, bad, like <laughs> deliverance where they're just praying over me. Like we had this one person that did essential oils and deliverance in our fa- like over our family. So she's rubbing like peppermint on you and <laughs> casting out demons. Like the, the therapy I've gone through <laughs> would like, it'd be a good parody. Like the jokes would be hilarious. Cause my life was, did you guys yeah. try oregano? I could See, not. that's where she I went wrong. I don't know if there's... That's how you get rid of vampires, isn't it? No garlic. I, I had all of the spices. When you're gay, they try they just, everything. You need a lot of help. So I probably had a dose. Oils. All spice, all the oils. I don't know. So I go to the therapist for another couple months. I'm like, whatever, this is not working. I decide to take it in my own hands, start spending my own money. And there's this big Bethel therapist. Okay. From like Bethel's where I went. And I knew people that had gone to him. And... Hey, I kind of knew him through ministry connections. So I was like, this guy's got a good head on his shoulder. He's a good like therapist. He's a nice guy. And people like recommend him. So I start going to him. Now he was actually really smart and started digging through my family stuff. And I started to realize, oh, my perfect family, you know, wasn't totally perfect. We had our own issues. Yeah. I started to realize I had fear problems. I started to like realize I hated myself and start to, I started to learn how to love myself and forgive little Nate and love little Nate and just see all those things. And so I'm like, okay, this guy's actually really good. But then a year goes by and I'm like, so I still have no attraction to girls. And he's like, you just gotta keep giving it time. Six more months go by. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is awesome. I'm feeling amazing. Like my fear has gone way down. Like you're like, this is working, but like I had no attraction to girls. Like I hate myself way less. I'm doing more athletic things. I'm talking to more girls. I have no sparks. I'm dating them. None of these girls I like at all. I've been with this girl for a month at this point. I was trying to date seriously. Wow. I had no physical attraction to her. I tried holding her hands. I was cuddling with her. I felt like the most dishonest person ever. I felt crazy because I'm literally like doing what they're telling me to do, cuddling with her, giving like this affection that I don't feel. I feel like I want to just like escape my body because my body just feels like I'm lying. And I felt so uncomfortable. Um, So I'm telling him all this. And he's like, you just got to give it time. And he's like, listen, Look at look at like a group of gay men. Like, do you want to be like them? Do you want to be like those like, you know, like rambunctious? I forgot what the word was, but like those gay people. Do you want to be like them? Those gay men? Are you like that? I'm like, well, I guess not. He's like, yeah, that's not who you are. I'm like, okay. And then a few months later, he cancels our therapy appointments because he's trying to become some sort of like podcaster slash influencer. So he cuts me off from therapy and I'm like, well, I guess we're done here. So I go back to just, you know, ignoring, trying to date occasionally. I'm on like hinge with like talking to girls here and there, not feeling anything. And this, our church randomly is like, hey, there's this gay conference. Um, we're going to send a bunch of our leaders there. And they chose me as one of the leaders to go to this gay conference no and talk about gay affairs. It was in San Francisco. And I'm like, wait, gay conference? Basically like a summit, like all the pastors come to this conference and talk to talk about what to do about the gays oh, okay gotcha the yeah. gay agenda what to do about the, the gays. gay agenda <laughs> um yeah the gay agenda so well like it was like more compassionate it's san francisco churches so like they you know it's something they talk about relatively often in san francisco yeah. so i go there and i'm like this feels a little targeted but you know they have the young the youth pastor as well a few others and i'm like this is cool love this um but they're talking and he's going into everything and he starts talking about celibacy and people are asking him questions. And I I was from like revival, religious, like miracle culture where yeah. you pray this away, God heals anything. I'm gonna get healed. Like that was in my brain. I'm like, okay, that's gonna happen. Now, more conservative, like classic Christian culture is on the celibacy train because they're not really like, because 
like Bethel believes you can heal anything, cancer, et cetera. Even though like I've watched a lot of people that, you know, my family thought would get healed of yeah. cancer not get healed. And so that's like in my head, I'm like, well, I just got to pray for that. But all of a sudden these people are talking about celibacy, which basically means giving your life up to God and saying, God's my only person and I just want to live for him. So I'm giving up romantic love. So this leader essentially says that celibacy is what he would recommend for most people. He's like, I don't see these gay men marrying women and I don't see that working out well most of the time. Mm. I've seen it work out a couple of times, but for the most cases, I'd say these gay men should be celibate. And I was like, say what? Like this guy that's like an expert in the Christian world, a lot of people follow this guy, is now saying celibacy. I'm like, okay, this is new information. Is this, is this what the church is actually asking me to do? Now, I had all these other solutions, obviously. Like, I was like, I'm going to change. Yeah. I'm going to force this. Or a miracle's going to happen. And I'm like, okay, you know what? If I was to think about my experience, this is the actual only thing that would make sense. Because, yeah, I could just suppress everything forever. I've done it for a while. Like, maybe this is what they actually want from me. Because this word was always kind of in the picture but i never looked at it this fully mm. so i get like we go we start we go home I actually go up to the guy and ask him my own personal question about this and he said he basically confirmed it and we're on the way home and i'm like yeah celibacy is like something i haven't really heard talked about much to all my christian like co-workers as we like to brief and they're like <laughs> yeah one of my co-workers like yeah um we used to try that a lot i like we used to talk about that a lot bethel but we believe in healing and we saw a lot of people healed a lot of them um, ended up, you know, going back though. And I'm like, cool. You don't say. But this, this person was kind of a therapist on some level. I don't think this person actually believed in healing for gay. So wow. that's a whole other story. Okay, but I'm yeah, like, but... I'm finally thinking at this point. I'm like, okay, this is, this is another piece of the story. Like this is definitely changing my perception. So I'm trying to get, get a realization that there's more to this story than I thought. And eventually at Jesus culture, stuff is just kind of getting, going downhill. Like there's just like HR issues. My boss was like really in my life, really involved. He kept calling me his assistant. I ended up starting to do his whole role and not really getting a raise in pay, not really getting seen as doing his whole role. And then this confrontation that happened. That never happens at churches. <laughs> yeah. So our CEO or one of our other, like the a different guy was like asking me to take on more work. And I'm like, does he not know how much I'm doing? And my boss was like, I, I told that to my boss and my boss was like, no, like he knows. And so I talked to the other guy again and I really realized he had no idea how much work I was doing. Mm. So I confronted my boss one more time. My boss was basically like, do you know how much I've done for you? How could you even like question this? Like I've given so much for you. And I immediately was like, oh my gosh, I'm the problem because I'm so used to being ashamed and being right, the problem. Like, narrative. oh, I obviously, I have like, I just want to be a big, important person. Like, why do I care about the title? I'm running this whole thing, but, you know, I just made this church like several hundred thousand dollars over the last couple of years. But, you know, let's just, I, I'm the problem. Yeah. Live like that for a little while. I got a little demotion. Five months later, I was talking to one of our young adults, pastors that's in like a another church. And he's like, yeah, what happened? There's some weird drama that happened. I was like, oh, this is this. And I'm like, I realized I had an issue. And he's like, really you run everything they didn't see that and he's like and really this 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 he asked me a few questions that totally made me realize okay. i had been basically manipulated to run this whole department and not get any credit and get demoted and then i got demoted for questioning that's crazy. that easy okay yes and believe that it wasn't so that kind of shaked my perception of jesus culture i got some space from it and was like okay this like isn't the perfect healthy environment like i need to get some space emotionally and i just that changed things a little. And then all this political stuff was happening where like I was starting to realize that the church wasn't coming out the most compassionate on like different issues that were going on. Like COVID was about to happen, like all this stuff was building. Yeah. And I just was getting some space. I'm like, I don't know what I feel about all this. I don't even know what I feel about being gay right now. I don't want to question whether I am, but I'm just seeing the church hit these issues and not hit them very well. Mm. I'm seeing leaders that I thought were perfect now showing, you know, their humanity. I knew my parents were human. I'm now seeing all these other yeah. leaders with humanity. I yeah. mean, I don't know if you know, like there's other leaders in the last few years that have just like shown a lot of humanity, yeah. big movements. Like IHOP was a movement I was really involved with and their leader just got accused of a lot of like really nasty stuff. All these movements that I was very, Hillsong, all these movements now have these reputations where like 
Christian leaders don't always have everything figured out. They're humans. Yeah, they're people. Yeah. So COVID happens. I stop going to church on Sundays. I'm just working from home and I realize I'm a lot happier. I feel more connected to God and I decide to quit Jesus culture. So a little while after COVID, I decided to end the job and start doing freelance. And once they call us back in the office, that's when I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely not going back in. And so at that point, I go to Hawaii like a month after and I break my leg on a bike um, in Maui and shattered my femur, almost died. Oh not my really, gosh. but like it was bad, yeah. bad, bad pain. So I am now dealing with all of that and I go home and have to think about my life. And I knew I might be gay. Oh, I knew I was gay at this point. I knew without a shadow of a doubt. But in my head, I'm like, maybe the right girl is going to change me at yeah. some point. But here I am in my house for a month dealing with like having so much cardio to now sitting and, you know, the, the natural like physical depression you feel from being like alone Bedridden. and not having any physical. Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. So I'm feeling all this and I finally have to look at my life, take inventory of everything. I am deeply unhappy. I am not where I want to be. I wanted to be in a family. I wanted to have this other life that my siblings had had. I'm the youngest and all my siblings have families at this point with kids. Mm -hmm. My life looks nothing like I thought it would. I have never liked a girl at once in my life. I cannot lie to myself and say anymore that one girl is just going to change that. I know if I'm honest with myself, I've never been physically attracted to one single woman. Yeah. That is not something that's going to change. I'm 30 years old at this point, which was another thing. Like I just turned 30. I could not look away from this stuff anymore. I had to face facts. And on those crutches, I decided I was going to download a dating app and go on a date with a guy. And I was like, you know what? I don't know all the answers, but I know enough to know that I don't think that this is as wrong as everybody's saying it is. And I just don't feel like the Christians have all the answers to all of this. Mm -hmm. I think I've been studying and there's like more to get into we can talk about later, but I just had some questions and I finally was like, you know what? I'm ready to I'm ready to actually see if there's traction to men really. Like if I let myself, what's that gonna look like? Yeah. Meet a guy, set up a date, and I crutch over to this like brewery and hang out with this guy. In Hawaii. This is so I gotten home. Okay, this gotten back fixed home. up. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, so I go on this date with this guy, and he's not like the perfect guy. He's not my type, but there is this energy that is happy and magical and fun mm -hmm. and i feel sparks feel electricity i'm like oh yeah this is what it was supposed to feel like the whole time wasn't it mm -hmm. this is what other people talk about with girls this is what i am missing with girls this just feels natural and right and good so after like we the date finishes i don't kiss him because i'm like i don't i don't want you to be my first kiss i don't i don't think it's like that but there's no denying that I was attracted. A couple weeks later, I met this other guy on Hinge and set up another date. I go on a date with this guy and he's much more my type. Really good looking, very much like just my natural type. I have a drink and I start to talk about my life. He asked me some questions that just got really like deep by the way we started talking. Um, and I told him I was a pastor's kid and then he turned out to be a pastor's kid and we start to dig into each other's stories. He finds out this is like my second date ever and he's really sweet about it Aww. and he's a really nice guy. That's sweet, yeah. And we just start to connect and all of a sudden I'm like, I actually like this person. We actually have chemistry and he's really cute. So we talk for like three hours. We go to another place, keep talking. Finally, I am like this guy, I want this guy to be my first kiss. And I'm like, at this point I'm like, this, is, this feels right. This feels more right than anything I've ever tried. This was like the most right I've ever felt in my life. So I was. So this is your first kiss ever in life. Ever in at life. thirty, I had smashed faces with a couple girls in like a very like non pleasant way. Um, <laughs> but this is yeah, okay. I had never really kissed. Thirty years old, never been kissed. So at this point, I'm just like I'm ready. So I was like, um, would you uh, would you kiss me right now? Bold move. I know. I was, I was ready. I I can be bold when I know what I when I know what I want finally. Took me 30 years, but when I knew, I knew. He's like, yeah. He leans in, and I'm like, 
I'm freaking out at this point. Like inside, I'm like, my insides are churning. I lean in and we kiss. It wasn't just like a peck, we, mm. we kissed. And holy, I was like, this is, this is what people have been talking about. This is what everybody is so excited about all these years. And I'm just, I get it. Instantly, I get it. Wow. And I realized it wasn't, it didn't feel evil. It didn't feel wrong. It didn't feel like this like horrible thing like I'd always been told it would. I felt like instinctually I would know this would feel wrong and I'd be like in shame. I didn't feel shame. It felt right. Hmm. It felt just human, more human than I've ever let myself feel. It felt like I was finally being me. There were so many layers to that where I just felt so honest and real and pure in that moment. Uh, we dated for like a month. It was really good. Um, we had a lot in common, but I don't think long term it felt right. Yeah. And I think we were both smart enough to realize that. So it kind of fizzled out. He actually ended it officially, but I was kind of like, I don't know. Let's take our time. So it was mutual-ish. I did get dumped. You got dumped. Let's be honest. <laughs> you I got, got dumped. dumped. <laughs> but after that point, and we'll talk more. There's more to the story. But just to close out, because I've been talking a really long time. And thank you for sticking around for this whole bit. But I realized through all of that, that none of the Christians had all the answers. There were all of these solutions they gave to me. There were all these mm -hmm. different things they recommended. I try, recommended, I do. None of them added up. And I was smart enough to know that they did not have all the answers and they were acting like they did anyways. I knew, I knew these leaders. I was behind the scenes. I was the pastor's kid. I was the per perfect person to change. And I had not seen one glimpse of change. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to be like proven wrong at that point. I was hoping yeah. that I would find change but I knew. I felt not myself my whole life. I feel like I never accepted myself. I felt like I never was comfortable in my own skin. And finally, after coming out, after accepting myself, I feel like I'm who I am. Mm. I feel like I don't have to have a guard, a filter on my personality. I feel like I'm accepted. I find people that accept me for who I am. I don't hang around Christians that think if I'm too fe effeminate that they you know, are weird around me. And I realized even at that point, and I feel like I have more answers now, but at that point, I knew there was mystery in all of this. And I talked to someone, like a kind of a, a therapist as well, who talked about mystery. And Interesting. am I okay with living in the tension of, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. I know the theology fights back and forth a lot. There's different theologians that argue both ways. But with all of that, all of that theology going both directions and me being where I am right now and my personal experience and me feeling so wrong trying to fake being straight, and feeling so right just being myself and being gay with everything else I knew I felt like this was the right move and right choice for my life mm -hmm. not in a just reactionary but thinking it through this is what feels real and yeah me. and that is my coming out story <laughs> and it's so long man you tried really hard to be straight I tried really hard you to be straight you tried super hard that's the that's the title of the blog I tried to be straight I tried to be straight and I tried so hard <laughs> It's because I tried the hardest. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so if you were to label yourself now, what would it be? Like, you have a girly boy, you have Gaithin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing all those up. What, what, would, what would it be today? Lovable, mm. loyal, and a good friend. Mm. And You're a great friend. Cool. You're very cool. I mean, I don't actually think I'm like super, super cool, but I, I like myself. Yeah. It's insane to like myself mm. and be allowed to like myself. Yeah. I was literally told not to. It's insane now. You, if I were to, you know, label you now, it would just be Nate. Like you're just so yourself. And I've seen you interact in different groups of people and you've never abandoned who you are mm. um, That's cool. at your core, which That's cool. it just speaks to the work you've done. Um, mm and the way that you see yourself and even though your relationship with God, I think it, it speaks to all that. So thank you. Yeah. I feel like we've covered so much. I don't even know what to say now, but I guess thanks for listening. And I hope this has been interesting and not too much information. I tried to make it as compact as possible, but you're still here. So hopefully this resonated and hopefully it was helpful. If you feel like you have a journey like mine, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll try and respond on Instagram or wherever. But yeah, I also want to say like I still feel connected to God just to sum that up in my story. And 
yeah, I feel really at peace with all of this, which some people would say is crazy, but it feels like the least crazy thing at all to me. Mm. Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Nate. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Anytime. And, um, can't wait to hear your story. Next episode. Next episode. Dun, dun, dun. Next episode. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna do that. To be straight. Next. Uh, I'm just gonna do it for the teaser. We need okay, a, we need an official teaser. Wait. There's an official teaser right okay, now. Okay. You ready? Next, Next episode, episode of I, I tried, tried to, to be, be straight. straight. This is just me. Just oh, sorry. Just me. Okay. Try again. Susie talks about her story. Trying to be straight. That's good. <laughs> Okay, guys, this is Nate and Susie, and we're signing out. Out.